So, you want to brew beer. If so, you came to the right place. First, we're going to talk about the basics of brewing beer, what is involved in beer, starting with the ingredients, and then we will get started on a very simple and basic form of the process of brewing beer. I'm going to do my best to put it in the most simple and easy to understand terms that I can. Beer is not really a simple thing, it is very complex, although it only includes basically just a few ingredients. But there are so many different variables and varieties and the things that you can put in beer that make it complex in that way. But for the sake of this video, we will talk about beer brewing in its most basic form and get you started on making a simple and drinkable beer for your first time brewing. Whether you want to start out brewing extract or jump into all grain like I did, I will show you the way to do so. Okay, let's get started talking about what beer is actually made out of and how it's made. In some countries, it is a requirement that beer be made of only four ingredients. Malted grains, hops, water, and yeast. These four basic ingredients are what comprise the majority of what beers are in the world right now. Historically, beer has been made from all kinds of things and nowadays wouldn't even be considered even being co called beer at all, which if you thought about how the Egyptians made beer at one time, they would cook bread made from grain and they would have people chew the bread with their own saliva and then spit the bread back into a pot and then mixed with water and herbs and spices and stomped on in vats and then the material was allowed to ferment naturally and then it would be strained again and served to the pharaoh and other people in his court. Nowadays, if we had someone else chew up the grains and spit into a bucket to make beer for us, we wouldn't be as excited about it as the Egyptians were. Nowadays, beer is made by crushing malted grains like barley, wheat, and rye, and steeping them in an infusion of hot water to allow the enzymes in the grains to convert the starches and carbohydrates in the grain into sugar. Sugar that yeast can ferment. If you're not familiar with yeast, I'm sure that you have probably baked a loaf of bread or seen people make bread or any kind of bread products. Yeast is a living organism that takes starches and sugars and converts them into carbon dioxide gas and into alcohol. Although you don't really taste alcoholic bread dough, the yeast does create a small amount, but it usually gets baked out. But over the years, people have found out that there are certain varieties of yeast that actually produce better results with beer and favor the sugars that barley, wheat, and rye malt produce. The first part in the brewing process starts out with what is called a mash. A mash is when you infuse water of a certain temperature into crushed grains to let them steep and allow the enzymes to convert the starch into sugar. The basic home brewer is going to deal with one range of temperatures to produce a wide variety of beers at home. There is an entire science to what is called step mashing when you start out with one temperature and gradually raise that temperature to different points in order to break down certain things in the malt. But for a new brewer or 
beginning brewers that can easily become the hardest part of the entire process. So we're going to stick with one temperature today and that's about 152 degrees Fahrenheit. We will discuss the entire range of saccharification temperatures or saccharifying temperatures, however you want to pronounce it. The range in which the enzymes amylase and beta amylase or alpha amylase and beta amylase when they convert the carbohydrates in the grains into either fermentable sugar or unfermentable sugar. The beginning of that range starts at about 145 degrees Fahrenheit and the higher end of that range goes up to about 165 degrees Fahrenheit. 162 degrees is closer to being your maximum temperature without risking uh, destroying all the enzymes in the grain. The lower the temperature in that that you mash at, like let's say 145 degrees, will produce a much more fermentable wort. Wort being the name of the liquid before it's fermented by yeast. But let's say I mashed a beer or I mashed a set of grains at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes. The more alcohol you want from it and the drier you want your beer, you mash at that lower end of that range, starting at about 145 degrees. It takes a little bit longer to do that but you will get a beer with a little higher alcohol content. It will also be very crisp and dry and not have much mouthfeel or body. It has been said before that a little more fermentable wort sometimes has a little bit better uh, foam producing ability. Now let's say that you mash on the higher end of that spectrum, let's say up to about 162 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point you will get a very rich, full-bodied beer that is a little lower in alcohol content than its lower mashed predecessor. If I mash a beer at 162 degrees, it will produce a nice silky mouthfeel, it will be very heavy, almost like a dessert beer depending on the amount of grain that you use. If you only use 10 pounds of grain to make a light American lager or a light American beer, and you mash on the higher end of the spectrum, you're not really, gonna, really going to notice much of a difference in the outcome of that beer, except that it may be a little lower in alcohol content and a little bit more smooth drinking than being light and crisp. But when you start getting into higher gravity beers and bigger, heavier beers, the difference between those two mash temperatures is a lot more noticeable. You do a mash at 162 degrees with an imperial stout and you will have a beer that pours like engine oil. It'll be very delicious and very sweet and very dessert like but it may end up being a little too heavy but on the other hand if you have a beer that big like an imperial stout or even a, a big ipa and you try to mash on the lower end of the spectrum there's not going to be enough fermentable sugars or uh, unfermentable sugars to counteract the high amount of hops or the high amount of alcohol and it's going to be very sharp and very dry and it won't be as good tasting. So the average home brewer usually sticks with a medium body mash, which will be right in the dead middle, about 152 degrees. And that will generally give you a very good all around mouthfeel and all around average alcohol content. Most of your brewing software is going to automatically set all of your fermentability and your gravity readings on your software at a medium mash temperature. 
and unless you pay for premium brewing software like Beersmith that has the ability to change your gravity readings and your alcohol content by selecting a lower or higher mash, most of the time you're free or other brewing software is going to automatically create everything at a medium body mash. So it's just best to just go ahead and start out doing a single infusion of just 152 degrees. All right, that's enough talking. So what we need to do now is we're going to start playing some of the videos that I prepared for you on brew day. Not everything that I do in this video is exactly the way that you would actually want it to happen on brew day, but it just goes to show how you can go about doing it if you only have a few things, including just household items. For me, I just used a bunch of stuff we have on the property. So let's go ahead. We'll start showing some of the videos and I'll provide some short commentary in between the videos in case there's anything that isn't clearly understood, which is usually the case anytime that I'm talking. So, all right, let's go ahead and watch some brew videos. Okay, sorry, I lied. I'm back to talking again. I just wanted to go to show in the beginning that most uh, brewers start out with grain already crushed from the store. And I suggest that if you do go to the store, try to pick up your grain before you brew close to the time you're actually going to brew it because most of the time you don't have enough money to spend $100 on a brand new mill. I found a DIY page online that showed me how to take a spaghetti roller that you put in dough and it pumps out spaghetti noodles and turn that into a malt mill which has been somewhat convenient to me but it was also a big pain in the butt i mean it was absolutely horrible just grinding a few pounds of grain through there and it got a horrible crush through it and i only got about 48 percent efficiency which is absolutely horrible even for home brewing so although you can make a home mill like that or even beat them with a rolling pin in a bag which i don't recommend either some people have great success with that i think it's a big pain in the butt and either spend the money and get a good malt mill right off the bat or just get your grains pre-crushed and store them in the freezer until you're ready to go because they'll start to stale you typically probably won't be able to tell the difference between that and a little and grains that have been sitting out for a little while pre-crushed but for the most part just keep them in the freezer and keep them sealed up in an airtight bag. That's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and move on to the first part of the video. Alrighty. Hey buddy. We are doing our mashing process. I just added a little bit of water in here. Mashing is when you add the hot water to the grains to allow the enzymes in the grain to convert into simple sugars. And when you have a high protein grain like this here uh, home malted white wheat that I made here it needs a little bit of a what they call a protein rest which allows the protein to break down so you don't get 12 inches of foam in your beer and no beer so we're adding a, it's a little bit hotter than what I wanted it to start out with start out at 113 degrees for this and then we'll raise it up slowly over of course about 20 minutes up to about 130 degrees so we're just mixing in the hot water you mix it in a little bit at a time at first till the grain gets nice and wet and then then we stick it then we stick the rest in. i'm going to put you in my pocket here hopefully it doesn't activate anything So, gonna mix this all around, mix it up real good. I want to put the heat on, like number one and number two on the stove. This is a supposed to be a four-gallon pot. I've got another big one over there. I'm gonna use that for some water distillation. Well, there's gonna be water in it. <laughs> So, all right, so we're mixing up everything in here. I just want you to see all these processes. I, I milled the grain. I'll show you a picture of that earlier. 
I've got an old pasta mill. I turned into a grain mill, which is like the most crude method. It's even worse than using a rolling pin in a bag. And, uh, but here we got ourselves our starting mash temperature, or starting mash here. There we go. Sorry, it's kind of hard to stir this heavy pot with one hand. But see, we got a nice, oh, it smells so good. When I started crushing that, uh, that pale chocolate malt that I roasted, it was, it just smelled like chocolate and coffee all over. Just like really nice roast smell. So we got that. What we'll do at the end is I'm going to get a nice little green bag. I've got one around here somewhere. I got to find it. But what I'll do is I'll, when this is done mashing, you need to strain it out and rinse the grains with hot water to get the rest of the sugars out. So what I'll do is I'll put a bag, a straining bag, in that, uh, in that pot over there. And then I will pour the grain and the water through there, strain all the liquid out, and start the, the first, uh, start the boil up so we can save some time. I need to measure the temperature here. I'll have to stabilize. God, it smells so good. Uh, you just, there's no way you could even just know from here. It smells like a freaking, like the world's best, like cappuccino or something. Like it's so, just so sweet smelling and just absolutely butamous. So here we go. I'm going to get a nice soup spoon here. <coughs> well, <it> really, I'm <coughs> sorry, I stuck some grain down my windpipe. Dude, that really does taste like a cappuccino. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to take the temperature here. At 108, 110, 113. Perfect. Anywhere between 113 and 131 is t typically a protein rest. So, I'm going to turn the heat down. There we go, got the lid on it. And uh, we're starting our mash. I'll start the timer right now at uh, 20 minutes. Mash temp, we're probably going to slowly raise our mash temperature up a little bit over the course of 20, 30 minutes or so, because I want this protein in here to really uh, really get broken down. It's 100% wheat beer, which is not, you normally don't use 100% wheat in any beer because it's there's so much protein in it that uh, you're just gonna get so much head in the beer that you're not gonna get very much beer. I've had problems with that in the past from other, like my last wheat beer was real, I didn't do a long enough for a good enough protein rest, and I did the numbers were off from a website that gave me numbers for it, but it um, wasn't the right numbers. They're just a little bit off. Not off enough to make a big deal out of it, but... Uh, plus there's also in that same temperature range, about 113 degrees or so, there's um, acid that's converted called ferulic acid, and it will... Um, that's one of the chemicals that the yeast will use to make that nice clovey banana flavor in wheat beers, which makes wheat beers taste awesome. And since this is going to be like a wheat beer porter, it's going to be even better. So hopefully we'll see how it turns out. It might not get as dark because the grain didn't crush totally perfect because that spaghetti... Spaghetti mill, you'll see here. This thing, it's an old spaghetti mill or a spaghetti roller, you know, you put it in. But I put that together and made a big, you know, it's a lot harder than it should be to use it. So, but anyway, I'm just making this video for you right now. I'm going to try and get a hold of you here in a few minutes and see if you want to do a little bit of a video chat so we can 
you could see face to face what's going on here. So all right, bud, love you, bro, and I'll uh, get back here during the next mash stage. All right, so the next step in the process is now we're gonna go to a, it's called a saccharification rest, or with the word saccharin or saccharide, which is the, uh, a uh, chemical name for sugar, type of sugar. Uh, you're allowing the, there's a enzyme in all malted grains pretty much that have um, the ability to convert starch like potato starch, wheat starch, all etc. Any kind of just simple or uh, complex carbs into simple sugars like fructose, glucose, sucrose, etc. And what you're doing is you got to find the right temperature range which is for brewing anywhere from 145 to 165, 165 being like the highest you could mash without pretty much losing every enzyme that you have. 165 is the temperature that most people raise it to to kill the enzymes when you're finished. But what uh, we're going for is about, I'd say about maybe 158. Uh, 145 is the lowest you can do. Let's say, let's just say 162 is the highest you can mash at, and the lowest will pr produce a very fermentable wort or really high alcohol content and little body to it. So it'll be really dry, really thin, and not have any. My cousin. But it uh. <laughs> but it will. If you mash on the higher end, like let's say 162, you'll get a, a beer that's got a really big mouthfeel to it, really nice and chewy. Uh huh, that's what it's called. And it'll, got a, it'll have a lot of body, but not as high of an alcohol content. And so we're going to mash a little bit higher than midway because we want, for this beer, I want it to be extra, I want it to be nice and malty, nice and thick and syrupy. And usually you do about 152 and a half. That was an epic part. Uh, you do about 152, 152 degrees for about an hour, and that will give you a nice medium bodied wort where you won't lose your alcohol and you won't have a super dry beer. So, a lot of uh, brewing software just automatically calculates everything at 152 because the uh, a lot of software, it would be extremely complex to measure the fermentability of every single grain and be able to know exactly how much sugar it's going to produce at that exact temperature and what kind of sugar. So uh, the new beer smith, which I haven't bought yet, has the ability to do light, uh, like highly fermentable, medium fermentable, or high, high body. Like, and uh, so that's what we're working on right now is we're doing a halfway between medium body and full body because I'm gonna add a half pound of sugar to it to give it some extra nice, uh, nice, uh, molasses flavor and uh, some caramel so but uh, well when it gets to 158 degrees I'll let you know all right thanks buddy I'll see you in a bit all right cuz see here this pot here has got has got three gallons of water in it right now I'm gonna add another half uh, gallon of water to that because it's supposed to be 3.5 gallons but um, here is the finished mash. I mean, just look at that. It is absolutely beautiful. It's a nice, thin syrup, which means that uh, the protein rest is probably just right to where uh, we're not going to get like 20 inches of head in a glass and not be able to enjoy the beer because that can be a big problem. 
if you have that. So, but, so we are almost ready to take the, the wart. We're going to strain. We're going to strain all the good liquid out of these grains here. And try to get a concentrate, and we're going to dilute that down with the rest of this liquid here which is going to be pretty close to the brim of that. It's going to be a little tough to get it in there, but I might even have to actually go get my um, my uh, propane burner outside and set this up on the porch and finish the boil outside because this is going to be uh, pretty risky. So, all right, buddy, I will take some more pictures here in a minute. When I start to strain the grain, I'll show you the process here. I'm going to do a very crude process of, I'm literally just going to scoop the grains in here. I'm going to take the grains out of here with a nice little something like this. I'm still going to put a, uh, I'm still going to put a bag in the bot. If I can find my grain bag, I'm going to put a bag in the bottom of this yellow pot here. That's nice and hot. I'm going to strain the grains out of here and put them in this other pot. Should be about that much of grains. And they're going to be nice. They're still going to have a lot of starch in them. So then we're going to take them and dump those grains after they leave all the good thick liquid. That's your first wort. It's called your first wort. It's really thick. It's like maple syrup. It's that thick almost. And we're going to take the leftover grains that are still full of good sugar and we're going to put it in that pot and I'm going to dump it in there in this pot here with a strainer in it. So we literally are giving the grains a bath to extract every last bit of goodness from it. And then the, you'll see a thinner, really light, weaker version of the same, same thing over here. And then... When you combine the two together, you'll get your your uh, pre-beer, basically, or pre-pre-beer. Because then we'll take it and put it outside, get the boil going. As soon as the boil starts, we will uh, get the hops and boil for an hour to get all of our, I, I summarize all of our hop oils and get bitterness in it to just the right amount. And then... Uh, after that, then we'll work on chilling it and getting it in a fermenter. But right now, I'm going to go find my grain bag, keep checking this temperature till it gets to 175, and then we will uh, pick back up from there. All right. Okay, bro. So what I'm going to show you here, to show you how what I'm going to do here, it's extremely good, difficult to do with one hand. So, I'm going to try to hold the phone like this. What we're going to do is I'm going to scoop some of this malt liquid over here. So you're scooping it up. There's lots of liquid in there. Take it, dump it in there. This is the easiest way to do it without doing a big pain in the butt process all at once. So, you just strain all the grains out. See, it didn't get really crushed very well, so I'm probably not going to get bomb diggity efficiency like I should. But this is closer to how things are probably done a hundred years ago, a couple hundred years ago, when they didn't quite totally understand everything. So, I'm going to take this and pour that liquid right over top just enough. Then, I'm just gonna take the. It's gonna drain out the bottom. You'll see here. Strain. In this part, you don't have to totally strain everything out. It'll make it a lot easier if you get most of it out. But you don't have to get every bit of liquid because we're gonna take these grains and dump them in a water bath and rinse them anyway. But it just makes it easier to just get as much as you can out right now. Plus, that first wart right down there, that liquid's gonna be so good. Oh my god. 
So, I take that, take it in here, dump it. And this stuff, when it's done, makes excellent bread. So, I just do that again and again and again, and I'll be, I'll show you what the end process looks like. Over and out. Okay, cuz, I'm going to show you something here. This is doing this without the proper equipment, aka the hard way. This is what it looks like. Okay, here I have this, uh, it's like a, it's supposed to be for honey. It's a straining, uh, thing. I put the grains in there, dunked it in this pot of water, and let it sit so I could wash out the majority of the sugar into this water. That's why it's already dark. So now what I'm doing, because there's still a lot of sugar in there and the weave is too tight to let all of the sugar rinse out correctly. So what I'm doing is I'm putting sugar in here. I'm going to hope to see if I can get this to just go just right. Take this, this phone's in my pocket. See there's, if you really look down inside of here, it's a lot of good like looking syrup like in here there's a lot of syrup in there very very syrupy so what I'm going to do is take this stuff and put it in here in a nice little and we're basically doing a freaking sponge bath by hand with every single so you want to catch that syrup. So what I'm gonna do is try to pull up a little higher. And then we're gonna take this. This is when you don't have as much equipment, but this means you're getting it done. And we're doing it almost like they do back in the old days. And take this liquid here and just pour it right over top. Pour it right over top. And you're rinsing out all that good sugar underneath. Every ounce of sugar, and there's already sugar in the water, but it's still going to dilute it down. And you'll notice after you rinse it, the, sugar, the grains will be a lot lighter. Because you know that your end, they'll be thinner. The liquid on the outside will be thinner and they uh, won't look as sticky either. Because all the sugar is ex exactly that. It's sugar and it's sticky. So when you brew, you get sweet sticky wort all over you. W-O-R-T. Supposedly pronounced wort, but there's no way in hell I'm going to be saying wort, wort, wort. So, and then you're just rinsing that out really good. And look at the bottom, it's nice and dirty water. And then you just take that, put it over here. I've got my phone stuck in my pocket. Just barely hanging out. So, And you just push a little bit. Just push a little bit. You don't have to get every ounce out, but we're going to try to get as much as we can. Just try to get as much. Because if you squeeze too hard, you can get some extra nasties. This is when you know you love beer is when you do it this way. Because this is, it's already taken me 30 minutes almost just to do this batch by batch. Like each, this is like a two cup strainer. So I'd like to do is get a big one, a nice one of those big ones, but they're like $15. This is like a dollar at the dollar store. But eventually here, if I get my disability, I'm going to have myself a automatically pumping system. You saw that one I showed you, so there you go. So I'm going to go back to using both hands here in a second. Bring it some good old-fashioned uh, grapefruit juice, since I don't have any beer. And it's best not to drink while you're brewing right until you get to about the boil and then that's when you can't really mess anything up i probably already got some bugs floating in here but you know what bugs never killed anybody well except for like spiders but that's a different story so well, the cool thing is we already got some freaking awesome awesome high quality work going on right here 
when it gets done there there's this almost 4.3 gallons right here uh, with this wide of a container and the uh, altitude and everything out here and the dryness I'll burn about one and a half gallons of water off for the hour that I'm going to be uh, doing this so all right bro it'll be over and out here in a moment and uh, once I get the boil uh, started I'll do another little video here so all right bro at this point I just wanted to intercede in the recording to say that typically when you are doing this process as brewing a bag or like I'm doing it here typically you would just mash your grain in the entire volume of water that you needed I think the reason why I did it this way in this video is because the entire volume of mash water and the grain would have exceeded the size of the pot that I have. So typically you would just get a pot big enough the first time and only put what you need in there and just take all the grain out all at once instead of trying to do the sugar bath with each scoop like I was doing. That's all I wanted to say. That in that part of the video it was a lot harder than it needed to be but typically you would just have a bigger pot and you would use the entire volume of water to begin with and then that way you don't have to do any of this long process that I'm doing you would just simply just pull a bag out and it would leave all the liquid behind and you take the grain and set it off to the side that's it so let's continue the video all right buddy so I lit the uh, burner. I'm going to turn the burner for a second. Nice. Let's see what I see. That nice, beautiful blue color. Look right inside there. It's way more blue than it's showing up in there. But anyway, we got all of the grain strained. It was a pain in the butt. I mean, we're talking a pain in the butt. But this is what happens when you're poor and you can't afford to buy the rest of your equipment right now. Because you were so hurt last time that you forgot to clean out your other stuff. And you broke some stuff. And you lost some stuff. And some stuff got attacked by inclement weather in the garage because of a leak. And all the good stuff combined. But see, we got a nice, beautiful wart there. I checked my numbers. I used the hydrometer. It's a little glass tube. I'll show you that a little later after the boil. I'll show you how to measure your specific gravity. But, take a little tasty here. Let's see. It's not too bad. It's a little bland, but that's because it's diluted down a good bit. But, anyway, I checked it out, I ran my numbers, I, 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 we got a specific gravity of 1.030, which means that there's uh, three, the water weighs three hundredths of one part. or three parts per hundred more with sugar in it, basically. So if you had one drop of water, three hundredths of that drop of water is sugar. So if there's a hundred ounces in here, three ounces of it is pure sugar extract. It's, but at the temperature I took it at, it was like 96 something degrees and you have to compensate the hydrometer for uh, a 60 to 65 degree reading of some kind of wild animal hair inside of my phone case here but yeah you uh you uh change it for the temperature you you uh, it's a, not calibrate but uh, you can adjust it. I'll show you here in my little dandy book that my beautiful and wonderful wife bought for me on our anniversary. It's this brew journal here. 
It's a craft beer brew book. I'm going to put on the light so you can see. Now, hold on. I'm going to stop this for just a moment so I can get my camera resituated. Here we go. We're starting over again. Because sometimes it, if I change orientation halfway through the video, it doesn't, it'll doesn't. it stick with that one and it doesn't show everything. But it'll show you all the table contents. Plato, he was a wise man who invented beer. And in here you can write down your individual notes for everything. It's got conversion charts. It shows you what proper glassware, beer color reference, ABV chart, hops chart, and yeast strains chart. It's so cool because you can go in. It'll tell you exactly what kind of hops and yeast that there are to buy. I've got a conversion chart over here. Pounds for cups for sugar additions. Uh, shows Celsius to Fahrenheit and mass... Uh, to volume or yeah mass to mass calculators for imperial and whatnot and then you got your conversions down there one cup is you know uh, volume to volume imperial to metric so and then there's your color charts I'd say right now the color is uh, to right there I'd say it's about a 17 17 SRM it should be about 22 22 it was actually supposed to be like 35 it was supposed to or right between there and 30 almost all the way down to the end so it's not quite black even though it looks pretty black in that picture but it would be about 30 or right or about right about there. It should be. That's what it's supposed to be. But it'll darken up quite a bit after the boil. See, there's your glassware references and charts and stuff. It'll tell you what kind of beers that you're supposed to put in there. I'll take a little snapshot of this and send it to you. And then here's the ABV chart. See, with a hydrometer, it's a little glass tube that you stick in, in any kind of vessel. Like, you know, you got like a nice tall thin like a beaker you fill it up with liquid high enough and the depending on the amount of uh dissolved solids in the water it'll actually make the water resist weight it'll make the water cause buoyancy in the weighted glass tube that goes in there and depending on how much dissolved solids are in in the uh the, your liquor or your wart that it will actually push up on the hydrometer and tell you the contents of the water that it's in so like here it says if we just like raw beer just threw it straight in the fermenter it'd be you're looking at 1035 it's supposed to ferment down to I'd say about six or seven so it'd be like 3.5 to 3.6 ABV. It'd be pretty low right now. But since we're going to cut it down, we're going to boil it down, it should take that beer down to like 40 something, 47. It's supposed to take it to about 6 ABV from my computer. And what I, I checked and the amount of sugar that I got extracted, I, it took me down from 70% efficiency to 60% because the, the crush that I had with that, uh, that roller mill was not very good. But my computer says it should be about 6% uh, post-boil. So we're looking, it's supposed, it should ferment down to right about I guess zero well no it's supposed to go to uh, uh, let me see here I'm guessing it'll probably ferment down to about eight or six so we're looking at like 1055 uh, 1 0.055 Or specific gravity. I don't remember what the computer said. But when you boil it down, the water will boil and it concentrates the sugar. That's what I'm trying to say. So it'll go from 1035 to like 1055 by the time it concentrates. And then I'll show you after the boil how to take some and uh, 
take a measurement and put it in there. And you'll see how much alcohol this beer is going to produce. And I had kind of a funky mash, so we'll see. It might be really end up being really heavy and syrupy, which is just fine with me. I love heavy beers. But see here, you got your heart hops chart. It shows you substitutions, like here. Like let's uh, let's find the, the one that we got today. Uh, I have left over is Galaxy, and it's right here. Here we go, Galaxy. It's an Australian. Type it's for bittering and aroma 11 to 13 percent and the, the cool thing is mine is at 14.3 percent which is a lot higher alpha acids and the good thing is that with a, um, a German style beer like this they're usually t German wheat beers are typically very low like we're talking like 12 to 17 IBUs even for a big beer like this because you really want that malt to sh shine through so like here, the thing is that when you use noble hops, which are like the uh, noble hops are like your original strains of hops that uh, that people started out with that were just you know they were your standard all around hops. They're uh, just kind of like noble gases. They're very stable. They're just a good all around hop. You know they're they're the originals and they were all very low. They were you know cultivated wild. And uh, don't quote me on all of this, but it's, you know, this is from what I know. And uh, so with uh, Noble Hops, they're like 4% 4 4 alpha acids. And all your new modern varieties are like 10 and up. But, like, see Fuggle right there. You can see Fuggle. The UK version is 4 to 5.5%. It's good for English-style beers and lagers. Uh, you can substitute with U.S. Fuggle, Styrian, Golings. Golding or Willamette, and the profile is grassy, floral, herby, hoppy, and it says waddy, but apparently it's supposed to be woody, which I like wood flavored. But Galaxy right here, read the description on that. It says Galaxy bittering and aroma could be used for both pale ale, IPAs, barley wines, uh, possible substitution Simcoe, Citra, Amarillo. It's got a high alpha hop citrusy, which they're spelling some weird stuff in here. Slight passion fruit aroma. This galaxy smells really dang good. And I read a long time ago that if you wanted to make a really good uh, wheat beer, that sometimes the amount of your really low acid hops is you have to put a lot in there. You have to put a lot more than... What you would with other types of hops and the more vegetable matter you put in there the more problems you might possibly have from those uh from those uh vegetable compounds in there it can give you can get more like vegetal matter ah oh, son of a biscuit gotta relight this thing hold on bro so is that the more of the the hops you throw in there you're gonna get some off flavors and grassy crap and stuff and uh, what you can do to eliminate that is use less of a higher alpha acid stuff. I hope I got this oriented the right way. So, yeah, so that's good because all I have left, because I'm broke, is some Galaxy Hops I bought a while back. So, I'm only going to use like a quarter of an ounce or t uh, like 0.22 ounces to give, uh, I think it's going to be like six, six grams total. It's going to give it like 17 IBUs. There's my, I've got one circled that are, have rooty and earthy. This one here, Pride of Ring one, that's what I used in my Exterminate Stout. Very woody, earth, earthy, herbal aroma, bitty, bitter. And uh, I like those kind of flavors. And Pride of Ring one is typically not used. Even though it says all purpose, the only, the only beer that I know of uh, currently on the market that Everyone knows, at least brewers know, 
has Pride of Ringwood as flavoring in it is Foster's. And that's probably why you and I like that. Because we both like those real dark, skunky. And Foster's Ale, the green can, not the lager. The lager has it in there. It's just not nearly as pronounced. But... <clears throat> Here's your yeast strains here. We got hops, your yeast starts over here. So we're going to go Lalamond, uh, we're using Lalamond White. We're going for Lalamond Munich Wheat Beer Yeast. It's what we're, we're going to get. Yeah, Munich German Wheat right there. Oh man, it's, that's what we're going to be using today. You got, we got to have that to get the nice... Uh, Are they freaking drunk? Lalamond doesn't make liquid. Oh, these guys are retarded. There, I noticed that this is extremely well put together. I mean, I'm not... It is extremely well put together. But, there is some mistakes in this book. Like spelling errors and... This one right here, Munich German wheat yeast it says that it's a liquid it is not it's not a liquid it's dry because that's what lalamond is famous for lalamond and danstar they're they're the same company but it says liquid is supposed to be dry mountains white labs liquid mango jack dry 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 no brewers dry, dry. Lalamond Windsor. So see, all of Lalamond's are dry, and they just have that as that's just a mistake, right there. But the optimum fermentation temperature apparently is 63, right on the nose, and that's going to be slightly difficult to accomplish uh, to get it right on that nose. But I'm going to try anyway. I might have to clean out my uh, my wine fridge and put a put an airlock in there and keep it at 63, which that's not too bad because it uh, perfect place to do it. All right, bro. So we're getting the we're getting the boil going here. Should be starting any minute now. I wanted it to get a nice slow boil started because I don't want to wait waste my gas. Because if you try to put the heat to it right away, it just all blows up the sides. So, see, I'm getting ready to add some more notes here about what's going on here. And uh, I will show you when the boil gets started. See, we'll, you can already see it rolling a little bit, which is pretty awesome. I love to watch that. And what happens during the boil is... Here, I'll turn the light off. What happens during the boil is that the yeast or the, not the yeast, the protein in the beer and the, the liquid starts to coagulate and it starts to cook and it, and it cooks all the leftover stuff. It gelatinizes the leftover starches. Which there shouldn't technically be any leftover starches, but, you know, this is a very crude process that I'm doing right now because of the lack of proper equipment. So there's going to be some leftovers and stuff like that in there, but it's not bad because the yeast can still technically convert that stuff. You know, some of it, it can over time. But what we're looking at right here is magic waiting to happen. And it smells so good. Oh, crap, my freaking, well, it's going to taste like my coat. Oh, God, that smells so good, dude. You have no clue. So, we're making beer, bro. Making beer. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign off of this for right now. I'm gonna have some grapefruit juice and get the uh, get the heat cranked up here. Get that started, and then once that starts cooking, I'm gonna hit the timer for 60 60 minutes, and then I'm gonna throw my little hop addition in there, and we're going to have beer in about an hour. Well won't be fermented yet but you know what I mean I'm gonna have it in a fermenter this evening and we're gonna have it's gonna be freaking awesome that's all I gotta say so all right bro love you and peace out 
Having a great time, bro. There's the malt over there. Already put the hops in. Having a great time out here. You gotta love this aluminum pot. I barely have, barely have it just turned on and I've got a good rolling boil right there. Ooh, and that's a nice thick, that's gonna be my uh, water purifier here in a little while. So now our boil is done. So now what we're going to move on to now is the post boil process. First thing you do after the boil is you try to get your pot uh, into the sink. Generally, when you first start brewing, you only have a smaller pot, like a three, four, or even five gallon pot, just big enough to fit into the base of your kitchen sink. And usually brewers have to start out by just sticking that pot in the sink and you're going to fill the sink around the pot. Don't get any water into the pot itself. You don't want to contaminate your beer because it's nice and We'll just call it sterile for the lack of a better way to put it. It's been sanitized by the heat. And that's what's going to make your uh, liquid a perfect breeding ground for all sorts of bacteria. But we're going to give yeast the first shot at making that their new home. So first off, typically from your standpoint, unless you invest in a nice immersion chiller, which is like a copper coil with tubing hooked to it, that you can... Uh, pump cold water through the tubing into uh, and put that inside the liquid and it will like act as a heat exchanger it will allow the cold water to pass through the coal and come out hot and cool the liquid down but as a home brewer and just starting out you're probably going to just be doing the pot in the sink method which you're going to fill up a sink uh, full of nice cold water about halfway full and then you're going to take your pot and stick it in there with the lid on it then you're going to let it sit and get nice and cold or at least down to no greater than about 90 degrees if you're going to use dry yeast you really want it to be about 80 to 85 with dry yeast you can technically just pitch it and throw it directly in there but a lot of dry yeast they want you to take a little bit of tap water or bottled water that's just been opened. I use bottled water uh, right out of the bottle, a brand new bottle, so that it's clean enough for the yeast and clean enough for what you're gonna use it for. And you mix a little bit of the bottled water with the yeast powder and let it uh, reactivate and turn into a cream. And then you're gonna take that cream and dump that into the liquid before you put it in the ferment, or when you put it in the fermenter. So, what you're going to do is put the lid on that pot. We'll reiterate this one more time. Put the lid on that pot, put it in a sink filled about halfway up with nice cold water and let that sit in the sink. And eventually you'll go by and check and the water around that pot is going to get very hot because it's exchanging the cold water, uh, the heat from the uh, pan into the cold water around it. And you're going to probably have to drain the sink, fill it back up again a couple times in a row to get the liquid cooled down. You don't really want to stick anything in the pot at this moment, like unless you really want to chance it. You can sanitize a nice spoon. You're going to need to get some star sand from your local brewery or brew supply store. And you can mix it up in a bottle with some, uh, with some filtered water. And you can spray a utensil like a spoon down and stir that pot and help try to get the heat to move around a little bit better. So once it's nice and cool, that's when this next process will start. What we're going to do is we're going to take a hydrometer reading. First, you get a large, tall, thin vessel like the one shown in the picture here. And I chose a cheap beaker off of Wish. It costs about $2. It holds, I think, 100 milliliters of liquid, which is just fine. And it's the exact dimensions, about seven, 7 inches long and about 1 inch wide. Just the perfect dimensions of a hydrometer. So what you're going to do is fill that up about two-thirds of the way up with liquid from your cooled wort. You're going to take a quick temperature reading with your instant read thermometer, which you can find at any uh, department store like Walmart. You can find it in the grill section. The grill thermometers are uh, a little bit cheaper than the ones uh, straight for the kitchen. They can be a little wonky with the readings and temperatures, but you want to get your reading of your temperature right away. Then put your hydrometer in there. Make sure that there's enough liquid in the tube that the hydrometer can bounce up and down a little bit if it has to. But you do not want it to touch the sides of the container or touch the bottom because it will give you a false reading. 
So what you do is, like I'll show in the picture here, is you'll start to see the numbers on the uh, side of the tube, on the, on the glass tube that goes in there. That's the hydrometer, and it will tell you how much sugar is dissolved in your liquid. And you want to make sure you write this down. And once you do, you can look in that little handy book like I showed you, or you can look up online and find out your temperature calibration. So if, let's say if it's at 100 degrees, you can add six points to that reading. So if it shows 1.040 for your reading at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then you can add it and uh, compensate for the temperature by changing it in your notes to 1.046, which is a good way to do it. So as long as you know what your temper your um, your original gravity is before fermentation, you'll know what the alcohol content is afterwards. So that's the first thing you're going to do is get a nice little ladle and a funnel and a sanitized uh, uh, spoon or ladle, and you're going to sanitize the crap out of that spoon first or the ladle and dip it into the liquid and pour it into your hydrometer vessel and once you take your reading I typically take that bit that I used for the reading and put it in a clean glass jar to ferment on the side I usually throw like a couple grains of uh, my powdered yeast into there so that you can uh, watch it ferment in a little bottle so you don't have to keep poking and prodding at your fermentation vessel so once you find out what your original gravity is you're going to move on to adding your yeast to the fermenter. And you might also want to actually transfer your wort over to the fermenter too. The hardest part about this phase of the brewing process is trying to get your liquid from the brew kettle into your fermenter without making a big mess, losing all of your liquid or contaminating it on the way in there. In this picture here, I used a funnel, a large funnel, and I used a sanitized ladle to ladle a uh, around a third of the liquid in through the top of the uh, pet plastic fermenter there. Pet plastic or PET is a type of plastic that is very similar to glass. It has uh, very good handling. It doesn't cause any off flavors and it's uh, resistant to all sorts of things. It's very easy to clean as well. That particular bottle there cost about $22, I think, at the homebrew store when I did buy it. And I'm very glad that I did get it, because it's very easy to brew in. But anyway, at first I poured, uh, or ladled about a third of the liquid in there, so that when I finally did tip the pot to pour it in there, it wouldn't just run down the bottom of the pot. Kind of like when you pour coffee out of a coffee pot, and when it's so full, it just likes to run down the lip and underneath the bottom of the coffee pot when you pour it. That's what happens, except you have it with like liquid gold that you just spent the past five hours trying to turn into a finished product and when you watch it run down the sides and down onto the floor or down the sink it will literally make you cry so just be careful when pouring it into your fermenter and then once it's in there add your yeast and shake it up really good so you don't need to shake it up and down or anything special like that but what you can do is just grab the jug and grab it by the neck and swirl it in a circle counterclockwise or clockwise which will be more than sufficient as long as the yeast is basically mixed up in there pretty well you're just going to pour a little bit of shot of a about anywhere from two to four ounces of the yeast liquid that you reconstituted from the package which i highly recommend starting out with dry yeast 
Uh, it's very forgiving, it's very easy to use, and you can make some great beer with it. I started out using liquid yeast. I wanted to start out the hard way from the very beginning, and I have eventually moved to dry yeast just because it's extremely convenient, it's so much cheaper, and I can keep it around for whenever I want to. And whenever I need something special, or a particular strain that's not offered in dry yeast, I'll just go get it. And that's that's about as easy as that. But typically dry yeast costs about half as much, and you can keep it around for pretty much about a year to two years before it starts to go bad. So once it's in the jug, what you're going to do is you're going to end up filling that little device at the top. And I'm going to show you what that is in this next segment. All right, that little thing that I was talking about on top of the fermenter is called an airlock. An airlock is a small device that allows gas from the fermentation inside of the vessel to escape without letting anything else like bugs, oxygen, or other contaminants inside. As you'll notice, the one on the left is called an S-type airlock. The uh, set of bubbles in the middle uh, where it starts to curve, kind of like a, um, what are those stupid things called? Paperclip. There we go. I wanted to leave this unedited so you can see how retarded I really am. I don't know if I can say that, but I technically am. So, but you'll see those, the, it looks like six bubbles, three, three and three side by side. In there, there'll be liquid that you'll pour down in there, and it'll allow the, the air to go up and pass through without sucking any liquid back down. If you really test it out with going from a hot area to a cold area with your fermenter, you can test to see how fast that goes down in there and you will still suck liquid down there sometimes. So uh, that one is a good uh, indicator there. You'll see the second picture. The first one shows what it looks like empty. The second picture you'll see shows what it looks like with liquid in it. The same with the last two there, which is, uh, I think it's considered a three-piece airlock. But in that picture, that one is a small cap that sits on top of a stem. And that one just likes to suck liquid down inside of it. So try not to squeeze or handle your uh, fermenter very much after you install that secondary type of airlock. It's very cheap. You can get one for about 99 cents or... Um, either one of them you can get very cheap but for the most part what you're going to want to do is uh, you just fill that up like it shows in the picture there just enough to cover the little air holes at the bottom of either one of those and you can always go back and refer to this video to show you exactly where it is some of the airlocks usually have a line that says fill and it'll tell you how to add liquid to it and i suggest using star sand some people will even use um, everclear or even vodka, because if it gets sucked down in there, it won't contaminate your beer. And you won't be able to tell that it's in there because it's already alcoholic. So, for the most part, you understand what an airlock is. You're going to be installing that with a bung on top of your uh, new fermentation vessel. Now I move on to the next part. I noticed that during the actual brewing part of the video, we didn't really discuss much about the use of hops in beer. Uh, we can kind of go over that right now. It's going to be totally dependent on the style of beer that you're brewing and the particular recipe that you're going for. Most uh, hops that uh, most home brewers are going to deal with are going to be pellet hops, or hops that have been kind of almost like forced through a meat grinder, I guess you could say, the lack of a better way to put it, but just to give you a visual been forced to something almost like a hamburger grinder and it comes out just like you've seen hamburger before like these long tubes of stuff but they get sliced up into these pellets as they come out and it's pressed together it mashes everything together so that when you go to go drop it in your hot wort uh, when you're brewing it's going to turn into like a not a powder but it'll break apart into lots of pieces and you're you'll get a very 
uh, good efficiency out of your hops. And when you use whole leaf hops, you don't really extract as much out of the stuff as you probably should get, but that's just the way that it is. But uh, typically, your hops are going to be totally dependent on the recipe. Uh, whenever you find a recipe, a lot of times you'll find that it's, you might say, or you might see in the video, it'll say, add one ounce of East Kent Golding's hops at 60 minutes. And you're gonna, gonna be like, at 60 minutes? So I gotta wait 60 minutes to put that in there? No, that actually means that if you have a 60 minute boil, let's say you're gonna boil, from the time that it starts boiling, you're gonna bo do the boil and stop at 60 minutes. That means that at the beginning of the boil, you are going to add your hops. It will be a 60 minute addition, not meaning that you add it at 60 minutes. It's a little bit backwards, but when it comes to brewing, you are starting at one number and counting down. It makes it a lot easier to remember that. So when it says at 60 minutes, that means the moment the boil starts. When it says add a half ounce of galaxy hops at 15 minutes or at five minutes or zero minutes, zero minutes would mean at flame out. When you turn the liquid off and you're waiting to cool the wort, you would add that hops at the very end to let it just sit and steep in the hot water. So that's pretty much all you need to know about hops. Your recipe will tell you when and how to add them. And uh, if not, you can always just uh, send me a quick message and I'll respond to you as fast as I can get to it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and see some pictures of what the fermentation process looks like and even watch an airlock in action. All right, here we go. All right, in this photo, this shows uh, the following morning uh, when I got, finally got up and we're getting ready to leave the house to go run some errands and go to the doctors. I just wanted to stop and take a little picture of what the fermentation process looks like. And this is a pretty neat little uh, uh, picture here showing what Krausen or uh, the yeast, the layer that they build up on top when they start to multiply. And the German call that Krausen when uh, it forms that nice little foamy layer on the top. That's yeast actually working together in a network on top, along with proteins and carbon dioxide gas. So here's where the picture kind of gets brightened up a little bit, and you'll get to see that. So uh, the next little part here, I'm going to show you what an airlock looks like when it's actually moving and operating. You'll see the liquid pushing up under there, and it'll show you a little bit better about what is going on there. Plus, you'll actually get to see the yeast working in the beer, which is one of the coolest things ever to watch the beer rolling and toiling inside because the yeast are literally just churning in there like a rolling sea. So here we go. We're moving on to the next segment, and you get to see something beautiful in action. This is what is called an airlock. It allows the gas produced by this stuff right here, that's the yeast. Ale yeast is also called top cropping yeast, which means that it is a top fermenting yeast. It produces a living barrier on top that produces carbon dioxide, gas, and alcohol, as you can all see. And if you really look at that, you can actually physically see the yeast churning the liquid. Isn't that, that's totally awesome. Look at that right there. It is, the liquid is just churning away. Those yeast are so active that it's just causing everything in the entire container there to just be frothing and churning. And this stuff on top is called Krausen in German. Krausen. Which is pretty awesome. What it does, this airlock here allows CO2 gas to escape, CO2 and other compounds to escape from the chamber without letting any oxygen back in. Because you only want oxygen in in a very small amount when you first put it in there to allow the yeast to duplicate. But after that point, it will use up all the oxygen and uh, create a completely oxygen-free environment, also called anaerobic, which means no oxygen 
or lack of oxygen. But you can see it, it's bubbling away. The airlock was a little dry earlier. It must have blown a lot of it out. But so I put it back on there. It's probably had a full, you know. But see, this stuff right down here is is uh, is protecting the top. It's producing gas. It's popping. If you really uh, just sit and watch. So you just sit and watch here. Look at all that popping and churning and all that stuff Are in you there. there. Yep. Can I look at your stein? Yeah, sure. Let's see, you can see all that stuff popping in there and everything. So that stuff's working hard and it's got a. I can already smell that wonderful, yummy banana oh, hey, bread Lord, flavor. So. Voice, all right, buddy, that is fermentation at its finest. In about a week, I'll check the gravity on it and we will see see what we're dealing with. All right, buddy. All right, now that you've seen everything from beginning to end, you can see that the next step that's going to happen is going to be preparing the beer to be drank. At that point, it's best to uh, leave that to another video, but I will still explain it in a small amount before we leave. Usually when you get done fermenting your beer, you make sure that uh, all the sediment is dropped out, you leave it to clear a little bit. Sometimes you can put it in a cold place uh, like a large refrigerator or even outside in the cold uh, for about 12 hours or so and it will cause all the extra sediment and unnecessary yeast to fall out of suspension and form a nice sediment at the bottom. Then you can use an auto siphon which I would recommend that you get an auto siphon before you start to brew because using a regular siphon is very very hard and easy to contaminate uh, trying to do that uh, the hard way. So I'd recommend getting an auto siphon and you can pump your beer literally you know from the reservoir or your carboy or fermentation vessel of whatever kind and you can pump that into a bucket with priming sugar. Priming sugar is an extra dose of sugar that you'll give to your uh, beer right before you bottle it or in the bottle to allow it to produce some extra gas to carbonate itself. Once you add that sugar and add it to your bottles, you transfer the beer to individual bottles, it'll take about two weeks. You don't really want to test that any earlier. Sometimes beers with a little bit higher yeast content normally, like wheat beers are going to be real easy to have a lot of sediment in your bottle and a lot of extra yeast that you don't really need. But it's probably going to happen on your first few batches. It's still easy to do and uh, it might carbonate a lot faster but you still want to wait at least two weeks it's gonna kill you to watch and sit and wait because it's already killed you for the past week or so to let it ferment in the first place but patience and you will have a great beer but once it's done carbonating you can put it in the fridge let it sit for you know a few hours to get nice and cold it takes a couple hours and the cold for the CO2 in the bottle to actually absorb it back into the, into the liquid. So you want to make sure that not just till it's chilled, but chilled and set for a couple of hours to allow time for that CO2 to, to absorb in there and stabilize so that you'll have a good tight carbonation that will not come out of the solution the moment it hits your glass, which is what happens when you try to chill a beer really fast. So after it's all done and said, you'll end up tasting your own homemade beer uh, sometimes within three weeks which uh, if you're looking for a beer right now you better go down to the store and go buy one because home brewing is not about making instant gratification it teaches you patience and teaches you to wait and to enjoy uh, learning patience and learning the trade and knowing that you have to wait for good things you like to uh, a lot of people like to age beers and when you have learned to let a beer sit to make it better, then then you will have a great time brewing. So all right, I'm glad of anybody that enjoyed my video. This is my first video ever, so please be kind and uh, know that I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to making YouTube videos, and this is the best I'm going to do for this first one. It's very crude, very rudimentary, but it is a YouTube video nonetheless, and I hope that you benefited from it in some way. So all right. Ha happy YouTubing and happy brewing, guys. 
I'll see you later. This is Mike from Omega Brewing and have a great day.